Bristol, Massachusetts. Hard to do when you're two years old, but uh, so, yeah. Uh, that's a long time ago. How many of you have your cell phone with you? All right, I've been checking. How many were just checking some of the texts or the emails that came in just to, uh, since we've been in the building? How many of you have done that? Yeah, um, I'm gonna turn mine off for a moment. I'm gonna start with an illustration. I've decided what we'll do and, and I am thrilled to be here. And, and on a Friday night, in the first time in about 17 days that it hasn't rained, and uh, we're in, and it's sun shining out. And so, what are we doing here on a Friday night when it's sun shining for the first time? But uh, thank you for coming. I hope this the conference tonight, tomorrow morning, we'll go till about noon. And then on Sunday morning, we'll tie together uh, some of the things in the morning services. But um, we're looking forward to it on a topic that I believe is one of the most relevant topics we can deal with, and that's understanding our culture. I want to start out a little light. I think we'll leave some of the heavy lifting for tomorrow morning. I was talking with Kevin. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to call Pastor. Can I refer to him just as Kevin? How do, what do they call you? Pastor Kevin, that, oh, that works too. I've known him for years as Kevin, and, and uh, so if, if I do that, pardon me if I get casual and, and real familiar with him in that sense, but, but uh, we've been friends a long time, and, and I hold him in, in very high esteem, he and Karen, and so if you don't mind, I'll, I may do that, but we were talking this evening a little bit and, uh, as, on our way in, and uh, it's been a busy day for many of you working, just busy sitting down after a full meal and now trying to grab your attention and so I can fully appreciate that. And so we'll do some of the really heavy lifting in the topics tomorrow. I'm going to take us through the first section if time permits this evening and uh, uh, I've got quite a bit I like to cover that's not in the notes as well and sometimes those can get into rabbit trails and and if you feed the rabbit, it can really run a long way. And so uh, we'll see how that goes. But what I'll do is we'll just quit at some time. And so, you know, it gets to be 10, 30, 11. We're going to uh, shut her down. <laughs> we won't uh, go uh, that. But first of all, it is amazing that, that we're here, that anybody from North Carolina would be allowed up in this. It was two days ago. Baltimore Mayor, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake has suspended all city sponsored travel to North Carolina and Mississippi due to those states' new transgender laws. How many of you heard this? You all have. Um, Rawlings Blake made the announcement Tuesday in a letter to city officials saying she hopes the city's efforts combined with those of other governments and companies will push, and this is a quote, North Carolina and Mississippi to change, end of the quote. The letter says cabinet members shouldn't make travel requests to the two states until the situation changes. The new law in North Carolina, it's called uh, House Bill HB2, directs government agencies and publicly funded schools to designate bathrooms for people based on their genders at birth. Mississippi passed a law effective July 1 allowing workers to cite their own religious beliefs as a reason to deny service. Rawlings Blake says she won't authorize trips to those states while those laws exist. So, uh, it's, it's fascinating, and I saw this, and I thought, I'm going up to Baltimore area to speak, all right? One of these odd North Carolinians. Actually, I'm not a North Carolinian. I moved in there. I'm a Yankee, um, and, and that doesn't go over all so well either. I'm from Minnesota and Pennsylvania, and uh, I lived there for many years, grew up in Minnesota. I'm a Minnesotan, and, uh, um, and so that's our home area, but um, <clears throat> did all my training, my college and all in Minnesota, and then and pastored and spent much of my ministry over 30 years in Pennsylvania. And, um, and down south where I'm at, especially the area known as the Research Triangle, it really is very cosmopolitan. There are North Carolinians in the area, but it seems everybody's moved in from some other regions. But, but we are uh, living, we minister, our church is probably 17 minutes from the state capital. And um, the state of North Carolina is in quite a conundrum. And uh, the reason being, uh, for instance, the city of Charlotte alone receives about $5 billion a year 
in, uh, due to the tourist industry coming through the central part of the state and Charlotte and because of the sports, et cetera, uh, that takes place there. And the all-star basketball game, the NBA all-star game and things like that are going to probably be changed. The venues will be taken out of North Carolina. So Charlotte alone receives about $5 billion. The remaining part of the state receives an additional $4 billion in revenues due to tourist uh, income. So that's a lot of money right there. Plus, there are 90 different sporting events over the next three years that get bidded out or appealed to the organizations if they would bring those to, for instance, states vie for those, North Carolina being one of them. And all those bids to colleges and other professional organizations, ACC, et cetera, have to be done by June 15. I say all that to say that uh, because of the issue in which about between 80 and 85 percent of the North Carolinians are all for bathrooms that say men and bathrooms that say ladies, and especially parents are concerned that bathrooms that say men and bathrooms that say women should be used by men and by women. And uh, so, uh, it, it, which seems kind of normal, uh, <laughs> um, common sense, uh, but it is now being really, really challenged. I'm going to read tomorrow morning as our introduction why that has happened at such an accelerated rate. And I'm going to be quoting from Al Mohler, who's put out his newest book, dealing with that. And I want to read uh, as an introduction for five minutes tomorrow morning on just that. There are some strange things that if you would have said things to you and me 15 years ago like this, we would have gone, really? Really. We, would, we wouldn't have imagined it. But Time, we're not living in a culture change. We are living in a cultural revolution. We have not seen, and there's a vast difference between the words culture shift or culture change and a culture revolution. And it's only been the last five years that we're starting to st realize the word that fits it better is a revolution. And we're going to define that tomorrow morning. That gets a little heavy, and it's late. So we're, let's go there tomorrow morning when we're more alert, all right? Let me begin by reading from Dr. Al Mohler, and I wanted to read from this book in a little lighter. I just added that introductory portion for us to think about there are things going on today, the last three months, that... Uh, uh, incomprehensible for us. Something's happening. But let's come down to where we live. I'm more interested in making this really practical for us as believers rather than a lot of the philosophical, political things that for many of us were marginalized. We sort of stand on the sidelines looking in, okay? But how does it affect my life? How does it affect of me. How does it affect faith community? How does it affect you? Here's an illustration for you. The Campbell family of California just might be the prototypical American family of the future, maybe today. Cord, that's his first name, K-O-R-D, Campbell, and his wife, Brenda, recently moved to the San Francisco area from Oklahoma along with their two children. Lily, age 8, and Connor, age 16. They also came with plenty of digital technology, and they've acquired more. The family is profiled by Matt Richtel in an article in the New York Times. As Richtel explains, the Campbells might not just be any other family in the neighborhood with respect to their digital habits. They might resemble many of us. Then again, they might be, after all, 
a little different. At the very least, they probably point to a new family reality that is becoming all the more common. Cord Campbell moved to California to start a software venture. And yet his life is so filled with emails, text messages, chats, web pages, and video games that he missed a crucial email from a company wanting to buy his internet startup. He missed it for 12 days. In Richtel's words, Campbell is struggling with a deluge of data. More alarming than that, his family is drowning in the deluge as well. As Richtel reports, quote, even after he unplugs, he craves the stimulation he gets from his electronic gadgets. He forgets things like dinner plans, and he has trouble focusing on his family. That's the end of the quote. And then Richtel writes, this is your brain on computers. Do you remember how that this used to be? Okay. This is your brain on drugs. Well, this is your brain on computers, Richtel asserts. Scientists are now beginning to document the effects of digital exposure on the brain. They are finding that everything from phone calls, and any rights remember those, to email and text messages exact a toll on your brain's ability to concentrate and focus. <coughs> Excuse me. Furthermore, they have identified a physiological reward for digital stimulation. They call it a dopamine squirt. That little squirt of dopamine in the brain serves as a physiological payoff for digital stimulation, <clears throat> and it can become habit-forming. It is for Cord Campbell. This husband and father admits to often being unable to focus on his wife and children in their family life. He goes to sleep with his laptop <clears throat> or similar device on his chest. When he awakens, he goes directly online where he remains throughout the day. During family time, he often retreats into his digital world. He has left family outings to play video games and check his digital gadgets. Brenda laments, it seems like he can no longer be fully in the moment. When he tries to unplug, he becomes crotchety until he gets his fix. And yet, rather than attempt to move out of such digital dependence, Mr. Campbell seems to be drawing his family members into the digital net with him. Brenda checks emails about 25 times a day, sends and receives text messages, and is getting involved with Facebook and checks it regularly every few minutes. Connor is becoming so involved in the digital world that his grades now are slipping. Lily, this third grader, has only one hour of unstructured time each day. Thank you, sir. Each day, and she often devotes that hour to digital devices. Connor apparently has a computer with internet access in his bedroom, along with his iPhone and his iPad. And so when he studies, though, an inner voice seems to call out to him to switch over to digital distraction. The Campbells may be atypical, not usual, normal, in the extent of their digital entanglements, but new research indicates that they're probably not as untypical or atypical as we would hope. Richtel reports that in 2010, consumers used three times more daily information than they did in 1960. Those who use computers at work change windows or screens an average of 37 times an hour. The change in human experience is so vast that Adam Gazelli of the University of California, San Francisco, names it as one of the most significant shifts ever experienced in the history of humanity and one with an inevitable consequences. I'm reading this because we're going to make an allusion to it a little bit later tonight. And what about multitasking? Many people claim that exposure to digital technologies prompts the development of a new mental skill, managing multiple mental tasks, that you and I use the word what? Multitasking. It's part of our vocabulary. Eli Ofer of Stanford University has found that multitasking actually does take quite a toll on the brain's ability to concentrate on any one thing. Furthermore, research also suggests that multitaskers have a very difficult time turning that mode of thinking off, a fact that goes a long way toward explaining why some people now are unable to handle real-life face-to-face conversations. They can't engage that long. Have you noticed that? In an accompanying article in the New York Times, Tara Parker Pope asks a chilling but revealing question. Has high-speed internet made you impatient with slow-speed children. Okay. The research indicates that people who are highly invested in digital involvements are less empathetic, 
less attentive, less patient, and less able to remember something as basic as a conversation. Just imagine now what all this means. Well, the average American is likely to express some measure of concern in light of this research. And while most families no doubt seek a little different, are a little different than described of the Campbells, Christians have to look at this picture with a very different and far deeper set of concerns. Now, the reason I'm reading this, and this is from Al Mohler's book called Culture Shift that was put out two years ago. The reason I'm reading it is we have so slowly drifted into everything technological, and, and folks, you and I, I live with it. I mean, I'm not a Luddite, and so I'm not going to throw away all the technology. We can't function in our ministry without it anymore. We depend on it. But it just moved in so gradually and took over our life that I can't imagine life without it. Is that what we are created to be? Is this the purpose for which God created humanity? The creator made us in his image and thus to be relational beings. But this relationality is intended to be expressed first and foremost in relationships with human beings and not with machines. A biblical understanding also presses us to identify the relationships of our greatest accountability, the relationships of marriage, family, kinship, and congregation, as well as the relationships of the greatest gospel opportunity ever. When these relationships suffer due to digital distractions, we bear a moral responsibility. The answer is not to throw away all the digital gadgets. The information revolution is here to stay, and it comes with great gifts as well as tremendous temptations. Christians are not called to be modern-day Luddites, smashing digital devices with sledgehammers, but we are called to be faithful stewards of digital opportunities, even as we are also called to be faithful in all our relationships. And then he wraps it up by saying, that second stewardship is surely of greater importance than the first. This stewardship will require clear boundaries, honest self-knowledge, authentic accountability. Otherwise, you may well end up spending more time with your digital devices than with people that you ought to love. Count on this, they will notice. And then he closes that chapter. Well, the reason I read that is because we're going to be talking about and trying to understand what is going on in the culture, how we got to where we are today. But more importantly, history is one thing. We're living in history, and history is just sort of a, a glimpse in a rear view mirror. We're standing in the present, and the real concern is we need to learn from history in order to prepare for the future, okay? So what is it going to mean for me, my family, our life? And then as we talk about it, what does it mean for church and what's happening ultimately as we stewardship our lives as stewards for Jesus Christ and give an account? So here we go. Let's begin understanding today's culture. And here we talk about then, as we look in page one of our notes, we're going to be addressing over the next few hours and then into Sunday its impact on me, my family. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about several groups tomorrow morning. We're going to talk about the new group that is probably making its greatest impact on our churches called the Millennials, okay? Those from 22 years old up to about 34. All right, and they're now having children and putting those children into our programs at church, um, making a difference there. We're gonna deal with the older people as well as in our church, those who are my age, the hairless, okay? And, uh, and so we'll look at that as well. And, and, and if you don't believe that there are differences in the way we approach, then just get into any pastoral staff discussion on uh, what music, what should we do with our programs, who should we start targeting in our strategic planning for our ministry, um, even uh, what, what we're going to do with our facility, who we hire next, what do we do, and uh, what do we do as pastors replay or retire, and how do we then hire to make an impact on which age groups, and watch how the intragenerational generational discussions start turning into generational boundaries within churches, and we're still not understanding those impacts on our culture. 
okay? And so when the millennials come, they, th they look at life completely differently than those who've gone on before them. And then if you think that's bad, get ready for the next group because they're making even different decisions, all right, and taking things for granted. And that's our ministry. And you know what makes a church strong? It's not the uniformity. 1 Corinthians 12, what is it? The diversity, okay? And so the hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of thee, all right? We get our strength in what? And our unity comes through diversity and understanding that. And so that's what really makes church ministry challenging but also thoroughly biblical and enjoyable. And so let's tackle some of that. As we begin this study in this series then uh, that we're going to the next few days, do something with me as we begin. Would you pray with me, please, uh, that God would give us wisdom and understanding. Father, we pray that as we look into a topic now that affects every one of our lives and we've gro so grown accustomed to living in the world around us that sometimes we don't even realize all that's happened um, to us and uh, our walk even with you and our impact as ambassadors for Jesus Christ of our testimony, of our life, of our lifestyle, and on our children. And we want nothing more than our children to know you and then our grandchildren to come to know you. And whether we're 8, 18, 38, 58, 68, or 88, it makes no difference. That becomes the driving desire of all of our hearts that we would make an impact on those who come after us. In the meanwhile, help us to understand what it means to have a worldview that is shaped by the word of God, by the living Christ dwelling within us as we then have the power through the Holy Spirit to take the word and it becomes the pattern on which we base our decisions, our lifestyle, our steps of obedience, everything we do, and our belief system then comes from the Word of God. So help us to understand that in the challenges that tug us away from the Word and cause us sometimes to question and doubt our belief system its veracity, the inerrancy of the word, this complete, full salvation in Jesus alone. When we ask how can all these other religions be wrong, especially in a world that's challenging the core, the secularized world, the core of our, it seems, of our cultural structures that have been here for a couple hundred years in America but for two millennia now and Lord it, it just seems that the enemy will do everything he can to weaken and challenge and cause us to become ineffective give us strength and may this study these Next few hours be to that end, please, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you look in the notes, I'm going to begin reading a couple of paragraphs, and then I'm going to uh, be adding as we go on. This gives you, and, uh, and by the way, I did something intentionally. Uh, maybe it's an experiment gone awry. We'll see how it works. I decided to go with notes and not with PowerPoints. I decided to do a become a Luddite for the next few hours, all right? Luddites were people who hated the Industrial Revolution and all that was taking place, and they wanted to re... And so to, that's just sort of the expression of, of saying, um, can we live back on some printed word rather than having everything be technological for us. And I decided, let's try notes, see if that still works and if we can work with them yet. Aristotle once described our challenge as the problem of a fish in water. Knowing nothing but life in water, the fish never even realizes it is wet. This describes the situation of many Christians today that we don't even know that we are wet. 
We are swimming in one of the most complex, challenging contexts ever experienced by the church. And every day uh, we are confronted then with new messages, controversies, opponents, and we're bombarded in our world of entertainment, amusement, products, and just everything. We are Aristotle's fish, and so I write here, our homes are constantly invaded by the culture around us. Our children are targeted by advertisers in, mar in the marketplace of ideas. Entertainment has become a constant. There's no place to hide. How are Christians to remain faithful in this culture in which we live? Moreover, the pace at which our culture is changing has accelerated over the past decade. Transformations in social morality, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Law, education, government have accompanied the radical advances in technology and knowledge. How are Christians to think about these challenges? Some Christians prefer not to think seriously about these issues. Let me stop here for a moment. Uh, years and years ago, uh, a great debate took place among theologians. It didn't hardly make its way into the pews, but it was going on across our nation. And as our culture, especially after World War I and then World War II, um, uh, some theologians who had come from 